Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my Friday Reads for March 1st, 2019. It's going up a little late, but eh, what else is new? <laughs> I also uh, talked in my last video about wanting to get up an additional video in February, which I wasn't able to get around to, so hopefully it'll be a productive uh, first week of March for me <laughs> as I uh, wrap up February, as it were, and then move into March. <laughs> Here's one thing that I technically finished today, but I'm counting as my February reading. This is uh, the, the graphic novel March, book one uh, by Representative John Lewis. He's part of uh, the U.S. Congress, uh, and a lot of his claim to fame is his uh, activism in the civil rights movement, uh, particularly in uh, sit-ins in, in Alabama, which is uh, chronicled in this graphic novel. Uh, because uh, in mid-century U.S. it was illegal to serve uh, black customers at, uh, at stores, at the, at the counters where, where they would be able to, where white people would be able to order food. And so this uh, first uh, graphic novel, it chronicles a little bit of his youth, basically to build up the character as someone who was empathetic and cared about, uh, cared about, well, first, uh, chicken issues, actually, because he grew up on a farm and uh, befriended chickens, but then that uh, went into human issues uh, with the African-American community. Uh, and he meets Dr. King, and uh, he finds his voice uh, helping to organize these sit-ins. And uh, anyway, this is uh, the first graphic novel that I've uh, read in a long time. It was an interesting experience. It actually did go rather quickly, <laughs> but uh, I tried to pay attention to how the pictures helped inform the story. Uh, like uh, at one point when he's meeting Dr. King for the first time, there's no dialogue at all. It's just uh, picture panels of pictures of him walking through the church and downstairs to meet him. So it sort of um, conveyed the gravitas of that situation. Uh, there's also panels like, like this one where there's not a lot of uh, text in this uh, text bubble, just uh, Dr. King, because that's what they want you to focus on. And, and uh, Representative Lewis is saying, you know, that's all he remembers from the radio broadcast. Or during the sit-ins, maybe this would be the editing shots in a movie, uh, to uh, get the tension up. They focused on uh, people walking up to them and focused on their feet going click, 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 or clomp, clomp, clomp. So anyway, I, I thought it was a, it was a well fascinating history, important history, and I, I thought the form uh, worked uh, nicely to uh, get the story out. There was a framing device of uh, of Representative Lewis uh, telling the story um, during Barack Obama's inauguration in uh, 2009 that was a bit convenient, but uh, you know whatever it, it got to the to his history, which is the more important part. Next, I'll talk a little more about a memoir that I actually finished, uh, certainly in February, and in fact I talked about on the last day of February with my book club. This is Dirty Wars and Polished Silver, The Life and Times of a War Correspondent Turned Ambassatrix by Linda Schuster. I felt like I gave it a little bit of a short uh, shift uh, last week, and I wasn't even that far along in it. Uh, I don't know. I, I think it's a, it's a very compelling read. I do think a lot of it still has to do with... Uh, what her life was like because it was so unique and uh, thrilling on its surface because it was life-defying in a lot of ways. She was in a lot of danger and that informed a lot of her character development. When uh, she was younger she sort of uh, rushed into the fray of danger and then uh, later after she'd been, she and her family had uh, defied the odds and had seen horrible things and uh, you know almost been killed so many times or actually her first husband was killed uh, she kind of uh, understood uh, the allure of a simpler life. And that has to do, too, with, I think, the, the main crux of this narrative wasn't about all of the uh, 80s and 90s history that's covered uh, here, where um, Schuster first is a uh, reporter in uh, Central America and South Africa, and then later she um, marries a U.S. ambassador who um, is an ambassador first in Mozambique and then in Peru. Uh, but I think that the real crux of this uh, of this memoir is uh, her relationship with her mother. And actually, I thought in a way that was heavy-handed. And from the very beginning, she was uh, projecting the guilt she feels uh, in the present about how she acted toward her mother in the past. Uh, and uh, people in my uh, group or book club were appalled at her horrible behavior toward her mother, although part of me thinks that uh, she was remembering it worse than it actually was to a certain degree, because it just felt like it was a little too moralizing. 
I feel like I, I guess I still have some issues with the way that she wrote this memoir. It's interesting because another member of the group actually said she was compelled by this memoir because it wasn't navel gazy because, you know, it was actually about fascinating, unique events in world history. <laughs> But what can I say? I like navel gazy memoirs. I'm about to start uh, The Art of Leaving by Ayelet Sabari about <laughs> her relationship with Israel and her Yemeni Jewish roots. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I do think to a degree her journalistic background uh, made the story somewhat concise, but although I was still taken out of it a bit by her sarcastic asides half the time. I don't know. I was thinking a lot like how much I like biographies written by journalists, but, uh, you know, memoir is a different beast, you know, because it's so personal. But I feel like I'm fighting this way too much for a book that I actually ultimately enjoyed and made me think a bit about, uh, well, my own reminiscences of uh, being in journalism school once upon a time and also my relationship with my mother, so, <laughs> and uh, Jewish aspects of uh, that were in this because uh, there was more than I thought. Uh, I mean, she sort of felt the pull to uh, being in the midst of uh, world-changing political action when she was uh, in her teen years and, st and uh, working on a kibbutz in northern Israel when the Yom Kippur War sort of happened right on top of her. But then uh, beyond that, uh, she, she had some cultural uh, Jewish touchstones, like a uh, Yiddish nickname for her husband, or the Shabbat candlesticks that she took with her on her travels in later life, and uh, how she sort of uh, played into uh, the Shabbat culture of, or attempted to play into the Shabbat culture of setting aside a day for family. So, so that was interesting too. And anyway, I've just, I feel like I'm rambling too much. This <laughs> video is going to get too long, but yeah, I would certainly recommend this. <laughs> I'm still in the middle of the God Surf series by N.S. Dolkart. Uh, it's not really technically, I'm not technically in the middle. I'm in the middle of the final book, uh, A Breach in the Heavens, with its interlibrary load sticker. Uh, this is theological fantasy. Uh, it's, it's very much a, an epic fantasy where the gods are very involved in the affairs of men. I mean, not actually directly, but uh, you can you know that they're powerful based on uh, the destruction they wreak. <laughs> this is a world of fearing the gods and uh, siding with the one who will protect you from others, basically. <laughs> I've read some reviews online that uh, take issue with, uh, I guess they call it navel-gazing again, uh, in this this volume in particular, which is takes place about 10 years uh, after the other two volumes, and the characters are doing a lot of introspective thinking. And this is me sort of like uh, grading against uh, the genre community, I think, because as a literary fiction lover, I feel like uh, character motivation and the fact that people have insular lives can be overlooked in parts of genre sometimes. So it gets to my goat a little bit like, oh no, they're thinking about their feelings again. It's like, yeah, because, you know, they're human beings. They're not just cardboard cutouts, or let's hope they're not. <laughs> Uh, although, to be fair, I do think one character in particular, his, uh, uh, his, his ruminations are getting a little bit repetitive. <laughs> but overall, I don't know, I disagree with the fact that people are saying not enough is happening in this book. I think there's, every chapter is uh, uh, it advancing the plot a little bit more and a little bit more. Maybe it's not breakneck enough for some people, but uh, overall I'm really, I'm really liking this, uh, and I'm intending to finish it over the weekend. Here's one thing I think I'm going to give up on. I've been slowly listening to most of this audiobook during February. This is Zenith by uh, Sasha Alsberg and Lindsay Cummings, which uh, people on BookTube might be aware of because uh, Sasha Alsberg in particular is a pretty popular, or very popular YA BookTuber. I knew going into this that the reviews weren't very good, but color me curious because of the booktube connections, and I was also hoping maybe the audiobook uh, would be somewhat like the Illuminae Files, like a radio drama, because it has multiple uh, voices, but that's not really the case. It's just that all of the uh, characters have a uh, character actor, and uh, I actually think a lot of the character actors sound really whiny, and I wonder if that's <laughs> a commentary on the story. <laughs> This is a science fiction story. It takes place in some galaxy far, far away. Uh, I think mostly with humans, maybe uh, one character who, uh, a group of people who aren't human. Uh, and it's uh, this badass uh, space pirating all girls group who uh, traverse the galaxy looking for dangerous assignments and money. And uh, at least one of them is on the run from a dangerous past. And uh, you know all about that past because half of her chapters seem to be. Uh, backstory ruminations more than advancing the plot forward. I like 
parts of this story. Sometimes the banter between the girls can be really fun. Uh, sometimes I get drawn into the uh, melodrama with uh, the bad guy, although it's a really bloated novel. I think too much is happening in it. Uh, there's a j main story, I think, is uh, when the main character called Androma, who is the bloody baroness because she uh, has a huge kill list, um, meets up with an old uh, boyfriend who drags her into an assignment for uh, someone she was on the run from. Uh, and so they're dealing with a lot of their past baggage while also saving uh, somebody's life from the main big baddie. But everything's moving way too slowly in part because I think uh, the uh, writers are much more invested in the character relationships than they deserve. I, they're just not uh, fleshed out enough. Uh, a lot of the world building is questionable in uh, ways that uh, SFF uh, reviewers have pointed out, like a glass ship and <laughs> dodging bullets. And, uh, another thing that annoys me is that for POV chapters, they don't always stay in the POV chapter's head and they dance around to another character within that chapter. <laughs> it's just a pet peeve. I mean, if you're, if you're in a POV, you should stay in that POV. <laughs> One thing I might credit the story for, uh, at least in terms of its detractors, is that I think it shines a, a more honest light on badass heroines, because with Androma, I think uh, the authors are trying to have their cake and eat it too by making her this badass killer, but they don't want her to be a bad guy. And so they keep on sort of uh, dancing the line, often with real dancing. <laughs> That's her way of coping. Uh, but it just doesn't work at all. It's just uh, hi just hugely hypocritical. And uh, I've always had a problem with uh, badass uh, characters not being really uh, fairly criticized or, or critiqued. And uh, I think more of them actually deserve negative criticism about uh, what their actions truly say about them versus what uh, we're supposed to believe. But anyway, <laughs> there's just too much to read in March. I just don't have the time for this anymore. I have another uh, audiobook that's waiting for me uh, in my Overdrive account. It's uh, Before Mars by Emma Newman, which I was supposed to read last year. It was part of my anticipated reads for 2018. I also um, want to start uh, reading for the Booktube Prize, which I was so excited to post about in January, and now I have to get to it already. And I have some books from my uh, Jewish fiction published in 2018 list that I'd like to get to this month. And I have a Fitzgerald reading project, which I talked about in my last video. So who knows if I'll even get to all of that, but I, I, but I do know that something has to go, and I think this is it. <laughs> So that about covers it for me now. I really do intend to be back uh, later this weekend or early next week uh, reading the fantasy offerings in this uh, collection that Delray I got from Comic-Con uh, last uh, summer. It's uh, samplers from uh, their fantasy and science fiction uh, offerings. So I'm putting this uh, booklet, a uh, book up here so that uh, <laughs> I'm guilting myself into doing this quickly because I couldn't get to it uh, on the last day of February, but now I have a whole new month ahead of me, so huzzah. <laughs> and I hope all of you are looking with optimism on your uh, month, new month's plans and uh, don't, aren't guilting yourself too much about what you might not have accomplished in February. I guess I, I got to get over all of that and just... Uh, keep pushing forward with reading and writing goals and what have you in March. So that's my plan. Thanks so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time.